Welcome to North Point. We're sure glad you're here today. You know, they say that Disneyland is the happiest place on earth, but I disagree. As you pull into our driveway, you've got the most adorable faces in the world holding welcome signs, waving at you. You walk inside and you're immediately greeted with smiling faces, handshakes, and hugs. I think if we're not careful, we'll start to take it for granted. We'll forget just how good we have it here at North Point. Disneyland, I'm sure, is a happy place for a lot of people, but I think the happiest place is on Loop Road in Spencer County. Amen. And we praise God for that. If you're visiting with us, we hope you feel that spirit. We hope that our service is encouraging and informative and will help you in your walk with Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we're so happy for another Lord's Day. We know that this is a day of victory when Jesus conquered the grave to never die again. And we're grateful that we can share in that victory. Father, we're thankful for North Point, for the happiness and joy that exist here. Just pray it'll always be so and that you'll bless us to stay united in truth and love. Father, we are mindful of what happened yesterday in Pennsylvania. We pray for the victims of that awful attack. We're thankful that Trump survived, but we know that some did not. And we pray for their families. And Father, we just ask that cooler heads would prevail. Amen. That your love would exist among the people. Amen, Father. And uh, Father, we just, we just ask your blessings upon our country. Yes. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 When I was uh, growing up, I spent most of my years attending St. Polycarp Catholic School in southwest Louisville. Now, the church and school were on my street, and so even when school wasn't in session, we would go and hang out there. It was a lot of fun, have great memories. But one of the most terrifying times was late October, basketball tryouts. Now, they didn't cut anybody, but they did normally have three or four different teams. They'd have the A team, the B team, the C team, sometimes the D team. Let me tell you something. As a student at the school, you never wanted to be on the D team. And so um, my eighth grade year... That's as high as it went. We were the kings of the school. Late October rode around. It's time for basketball tryouts. Well, when they gave the results of the tryouts, one of my buddies, who was, who was also an eighth grader, was standing next to me, and they read off the A team. His name wasn't on it. They read off the B team. His name wasn't on it. They read off the C team. His name wasn't on it. Yep. He made the D team. And you could just see the embarrassment and shame on his face. He was looking down at the ground trying to hold back tears. It didn't help that the other guys were making fun of him. His worst nightmare came true. He was on the D team with all the scrubs. Well, after tryouts ended, a group of us were still hanging around in the gym when my buddy came back in with his mother. They beelined over to the coaches. I could tell that she was talking very sternly with them. And after a few minutes, my buddy walked over and said, Hey, guys, guess what? I'm not on the D team anymore. I'm now on the B team. And as he walked away, do you know what we were all thinking? What a mama's boy, <laughs> right? What a mama's boy. Well, today, the two brothers in our story could certainly be called mama's boys. I don't know if that was true of them always. They are nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. But in our story today, boy, they come off like mama's boys. The story's found in Matthew chapter 20. Before we look at it, I do want to remind you about our big event tonight. We have a cookout and worship service out at our PRP campus. We have high hopes for that area. We want to start bringing light to God and to the church there. And so we're inviting the whole group. I know it's a long drive for some of you. But we're inviting the whole group to make an effort to come out tonight. We'll have an abbreviated worship service. Um, we'll just bond with one another, hopefully build um, some relationships with the community. That's tonight, 6 o'clock, out at our PRP campus. Our story is found in Matthew 20, beginning at verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? 
She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Amen. In our text, Jesus has concluded his Galilean ministry and is on the march to Jerusalem. He is headed to Jerusalem to die. And as he's on his way, a woman approaches, kneels down before him, and asks for a favor. What was her favor? Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. She was seeking places of prominence for her boys. And we're told that her name was the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Later we're told in other places that her name was Salome. Her sons were James and John, who happened to be two of the apostles and part of the Lord's inner circle. Why did she come and ask Jesus for these places of prominence? Why did she want one son to sit on his right and one on his left? Because she, like most moms, loved her boys and wanted the best for them, right? She wanted them to be exalted. Now this is probably prompted by what Jesus said a chapter earlier in Matthew 19 verse 28. When he told the apostles that those who follow him will sit on 12 thrones judging the children of Israel. Her boys surely heard that. Maybe she heard it too. But regardless, thinking about that imagery of sitting on thrones judging the children of Israel, she thought to herself, I want my boys to have the best seats. And so she comes over to Jesus. She kneels down before him. And says, will you grant me a request? Will you do me a favor? Now this is where it gets even more interesting. Salome was not just the mother of James and John. She was most likely the sister of Mary. Did you know that? It is very likely that she was the Lord's aunt. So this isn't just a fan or a friend or a follower asking for a favor. This is a family member. This is a close relative. She falls down at his feet. She kneels before him. Can you imagine your aunt kneeling before you? My first instinct would be, no, no, get up, get up, what are you doing? Here his aunt falls down before him. And says, I want you to hook up your cousins. We're kin, you know. I want you to do them a favor. Have you ever thought about the Lord's family? Jill and I never planned on having six kids. When I was growing up, I kind of envisioned having two or three at most. I never dreamed of having six kids You have to take two cars when you travel together. Well, did you know Jesus came from a large family just like that? Jesus had a mom and dad and at least six siblings. Let me show you what I mean. In Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 54, the Bible says, In coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? Jesus returns home, back to Nazareth, where he'd grown up. And the people there were astonished at his teachings. And so they asked a series of rhetorical questions. And in doing so, they tell us a lot about his earthly family. Is this not the carpenter's son? That's a reference to Joseph. Is not his mother called Mary? We know that his mom was Mary. 
and are not his brothers. Listen to this. James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Jesus had at least four brothers, and they're named. We don't even have to guess what their names were. We're told what their names were. And are not all his sisters with us? Notice that sisters is plural. He had at least two. Growing up in Roman Catholicism, I was taught that, G that Mary was a perpetual virgin. We referred to her as ever virgin. That she had no biological kids after the miraculous birth of Jesus. But that's not true. After the miraculous birth of Jesus, Mary and Joseph went on to have a family, and it was a bustling family. He had at least four brothers and two sisters. By the way, his brothers during his earthly ministry thought he was crazy. Did you know that? In Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 21, they come looking for Jesus, and the Bible says they thought he was out of his mind. They thought he had gone loco. He was crazy. But thankfully, after the resurrection, they became believers. And so this gives us some insight into his family, and it doesn't stop there. Did you know that John the Baptist was related to Jesus? They were cousins. We noted that James and John were likely related to Jesus. They were cousins. And do you remember that story in Luke 24? On the day of the resurrection, two disciples are making their way to Emmaus. One was named Cleopas. Do you remember that? Did you know there is strong evidence to believe that Cleopas was Joseph's brother? You can Google it. It's likely that Cleopas, one of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, was Joseph's brother. That would make him the Lord's uncle. And I know sometimes we tend to just focus on the deity of Jesus, right? The fact that he's the son of God. But don't overlook the fact that he's also the son of man. Amen. He was born of a woman. He lived in the flesh. Jesus would have grown up in many ways like we grew up. So he had a mom and dad, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, cousins. One thing he didn't have was a wife. I know there are some fanciful traditions that say maybe Jesus was married. There's no evidence for that. In fact, the evidence points in the opposite direction. Number one, the Bible never says he was married. Number two, at the cross, Jesus made provisions for his mom, but not for a wife. Surely if he had a wife... He would have made sure she was taken care of. And number three, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul argues that it's permissible for a minister to have a wife and for them to be supported. And as he argues for his right to have a wife, he points out many prominent people, including the Lord's brothers and Peter, who had wives. Yet he never mentions Jesus having a wife. Surely if you want to make your argument... As strong as possible, if Jesus had a wife, you'd have mentioned it. And so I just kind of want to pull back the curtain. I want you to envision Jesus as he really was. A man with a family like many of us have. And so I think this brings our story to a whole new level, doesn't it? This isn't just... Another person asking for a favor. This is the Lord's aunt asking for a favor. And what I want to do is point out three things really quickly about this part of the text. The timing, the tackiness, and the thoughtlessness. Let me show you what I mean. Number one, the timing. Matthew 20, 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. Notice the word then. What does that point back to? Well, in the verses just before verse 20, in verses 18 and 19, Jesus made a stunning statement that he had actually made several times before. He predicted his impending death. 
He told the apostles that he was headed to Jerusalem to die. Jesus said, we're going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. Jesus just had a very sobering moment with his apostles. Guys, we're headed to Jerusalem. But it ain't going to be good. They're going to arrest me. They're going to beat me. And they're going to crucify me on a cross. I'm about to die the worst manner of death known to man. And it was on the hills of that that Salome comes up and says, Jesus, do me a favor. Let my boys sit in the places of prominence. Give them a preeminent position in your kingdom. I want to make sure you appreciate this. Jesus was preparing them for his humiliation. But all they could think about was their exaltation. He's focused on giving. They're focused on getting. He's focused on sacrificing. They're focused on securing. The timing could not have been worse. Boys, I'm about to die. Jesus, will you do me a favor and exalt my sons? Isn't that terrible timing? Man. Like, really, you're going to bring that up now? I think it's interesting. Just about every time Jesus predicted his passion, his coming crucifixion, the apostles responded in the most inappropriate way possible. <laughs> it's like they just couldn't get it. In Matthew 16, Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem where I'm going to suffer and be killed. You know what Peter does? Pulls him off to the side and rebukes him. Don't talk like that. <laughs> In Matthew 17, Jesus said, Hey guys, I'm going to be handed over and killed. Do you know how the apostles responded? By discussing, who's going to be the greatest among us? And now in Matthew 20, Jesus says for the third time, I'm going to Jerusalem where I'm going to be handed over and crucified. And what happens next? His aunt wants a favor on behalf of her boys, a request for positions of prominence. This was a political power play on the hills of Jesus saying, I'm about to die. The timing was terrible. Number two, the tackiness. Notice verse 21. She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Again, point one is, she overlooked what he just said. She and her boys apparently paid no attention to what Jesus just said. But number two, did you know that she said this in the hearing of the other ten apostles? We'll see that later in the story. But she didn't even pull Jesus off to the side privately. No, in a public setting, surrounded by the other apostles, she falls down at the Lord's feet and says, Hey, these two boys of mine, give them favor. Give them a special blessing. Let them be your right and left hand men. You know what tackiness is, right? It's just having poor taste doing something that's crude, rude, or offensive. I think her request, under those circumstances, was tacky, don't you? Just tacky. And number three, the thoughtlessness. Verse 22. Jesus answered, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? They said to him, We are able. Jesus says, you don't even know what you're asking for. I'm about to drink a cup. A cup of suffering. Do you really want to share in that cup? 
Mark's gospel adds that Jesus went on to say, and are you willing to be baptized with the baptism I'm about to be baptized with? The idea is, I'm about to be immersed. I am about to be overcome in suffering. Do you really want to share in that? You think by now the apostles would get it, right? But they don't get it. They bullishly respond, we're able. Yeah, Lord, we'll drink from that cup. We'll share in that baptism. Just thoughtless. Not considering what you're really asking for. And by the way, when they said, yeah, Lord, we're able. You know what Jesus said? Oh, you'll share in my suffering, all right. And they did. James became the first apostle martyred. We read about that in Acts 12, verses 1 and 2. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. This would have been Agrippa I. He arrested James, the Lord's cousin, and cut off his head. He said he wanted to share in that cup. Well, he did. And his younger brother John did as well. We know that John was imprisoned. We know that John was beaten. There's a tradition that says he was brutally tortured. And most likely he died as a very old man after being exiled to the island of Patmos where he worked hard labor. Patmos was an island in the Aegean Sea. It was a barren, rocky island. And during the days of Domitian, Roman emperor, he would would send people out to that island. It was brutal treatment, extremely hard work. John, as an old man, had to endure that. And so they thoughtlessly said, yeah, we'll do it. Sign us up, Jesus. I bet later they thought differently. But the story doesn't end there. Let's notice verses 24 through 28. And when the ten heard it, They were indignant at the two brothers. That's to be expected, right? They've all been kind of jockeying for position, arguing who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom, and now James and John, they just upped the ante. They just took it to a whole other level. They got mama involved. And I'm sure that Peter and the others are like, really, dude? Really? It's not enough that you're his cousin, but now you're going to get your aunt to beg Jesus on your behalf? They were indignant. I would imagine Peter and the others were thinking, man, why didn't I think of that? But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amen. That was hard for them to understand. I think it's hard for us to understand. In fact, I would go so far to say this is probably one of the hardest truths to ever put into practice. I say that because it's so countercultural. It goes against the way we're trained to think. Many today seek to climb the ladder of success, grander title, larger salary, in- increased authority, more recognition. It's all about improving me, bettering me. And yet Jesus comes along and says, you know, in the kingdom it's the complete opposite. In the kingdom, the way up is down. In the kingdom, the last will be first. What? To the carnal mind, that doesn't make any sense at all. But Jesus says, boys, if you really want to be exalted, if you really want to obtain success, it's not like the kingdoms of the world. It's not through preeminence. It's not through positions. 
It's through servitude. Not self-promotion, but serving others. Really? That's, that's the key to success in your kingdom? Jesus says, yeah, really. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Notice he uses the term servant and slave. I think if we could ever truly see ourselves in those ways, we could grasp this a little easier. I belong to another. I am the possession of someone else. If I can start to see myself in that way, where it's not about me, it's about him, then I'll be less prone to jockey for position. I'll be less concerned about getting my own recognition, my own praise, my own glory. If I can ever truly believe that what Jesus said is so, my whole world will change for the better. To find, you must lose. To be first, you must be last. To be rich, you must be poor. I mean, these things are so opposite to our thinking. And yet they are some of the wisest words ever spoken. The dynamics of kingdom hierarchy are not like those of the world. You do not ascend to the top, you descend to the top. The way up is down. The kingdom is not about self-promotion and jockeying for position. It's about servitude. James and John learned that the hard way. Mm -hmm. I hope we don't have to. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this story that you've recorded for our learning. Help us, Father, to learn the lessons that you would have us to learn, to see ourselves in the right way. Your kingdom is such a special kingdom, unlike any other kingdom. And Father, help us to be content being slaves. Help us, Father, to willingly be servants, not seeking our glory, but your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're here today and not a child of God, we never wrap up without giving you an opportunity to become one. Will you come believing on Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God? Because He is. He left heaven to live as a man and die on the cross for you. If He was willing to die for you, won't you live for Him? He says to repent. Repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of life. He says to confess your faith in Him publicly. I'm willing to do that. I believe that Jesus really is the Son of God. Surely you do too. Then confess that. And he says to be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Just as he was raised up in newness of life, you're raised up in newness of life. At that time, you'll be added a citizen in his kingdom. But don't seek the chief seats. Seek servitude. If you've been pricked by the gospel and you want to come to Jesus Christ, there's no better time than this time. Please come as we stand and sing.